Over the winter, the Cold War arms race continued to escalate with both the USA and USSR launching new classes of ballistic missile submarines, the Ohio and Typhoon classes respectively. One famous member of the Soviet Typhoon class was the fictitious Red October. Across the Iron Curtain, civil unrest and demands for multi-party elections in Poland led to the country being placed under martial law. President Reagan wrote to Soviet Premier Brezhnev to express his concern and denounced trade sanctions against Poland. Brezhnev's response was to tell Reagan to stop interfering in the internal affairs of other countries, which Reagan then followed up with a trade embargo against the USSR. Britain was shocked in Christmas week by the Penley lifeboat disaster. The lifeboat Solomon Brown went to the aid of the Union Star, driven onto the rocks in a hurricane. The lifeboat had pulled four from the stricken vessel when a wave smashed the two ships together, capsizing both and leading to the deaths of all 16 people present. The five crew of the Union Star, plus the captain's wife and two teenage daughters, and the eight volunteer lifeboat crew. In January, Commodore launched their new Commodore 64 home computer, which would become the single best-selling personal computer of all time. And unemployment in Britain reached a post-war record of three million, as the nation shivered through its coldest winter since 1895. As the F1 world prepared for the season-opening South African Grand Prix against the background of increasing calls for sports boycotts of the apartheid regime, application forms for the new super licence agreed between FISA and FOCA dropped onto drivers' doormats and they were not happy with what they saw. The small print required that drivers be tied to their team for a three-year period, that they could not publicly criticise FISA or other elements of the sports organisation, and that they had to disclose personal financial details. When the teams arrived at Kiel Army, Returnee Nicky Lauda and Grand Prix Drivers Association head Didier Peroni got the drivers together and they all agreed to boycott the race until FISA agreed to reconsider. They all boarded a bus and headed for a hotel in Johannesburg, chased by the World Motoring Press. At the circuit, Bernie Eccleston announced that both of his drivers were fired on the spot, while FISA threatened to permanently ban all of them from ever competing again. Missing all the fun was Mark Sura, who'd hurt himself in testing a week earlier. Lucky for Jackie Oliver... Patrick Tombe was in Kyle Army to watch and agreed to take over the Arrows for the weekend. March's returnee Jochen Mass had also arrived later and also missed out on the bus trip. Not a wheel turned during Thursday's track familiarisation session as the drivers dossed down in the hotel's function room, with Patrick Tombe and Andrea de Cesaris acting as bouncers while journalists, team owners and the police all tried to get in, and concert standard Elio De Angelis banged out a few tunes on the piano which had been pushed up against a door to block entrance. As Peroni shuttled to and fro in a South African army helicopter trying to come to some agreement, the rest settled in for probably the world's wealthiest slumber party. Theo Fabi was persuaded by his team boss to sneak out of the hotel and return to the track, taking with him the only key to the toilet the drivers were all sharing. Mo Nunn brought Roberto Guerrero's girlfriend along to try and tempt him out, but it just ended up with her going in instead. Eventually, and to the relief of the circuit owners who faced a loss of over a million dollars if the race was cancelled, it was agreed to race in South Africa and sort out the licence issue in the intervening month before the next Grand Prix, and Bernie Eccleston graciously unfired PK and Patrese. Patrick Tombe, meanwhile, had had second thoughts and reconfirmed his retirement, leaving Arrows to find a third driver within a week, lighting on Brian Henton, also there as a spectator, after losing his Tolman seat. Roberto Guerrero and the Ensign team also headed for home, saying publicly that he wasn't fit enough to race. In reality, his Formula 2 team boss, Vili Maura, had just arrived with an injunction saying he still had Guerrero under contract and they had to all head back to Litchfield and ring the lawyers in the morning. And so, eventually, some racing could occur. To no one's great surprise, the top six spots on the grid were taken by turbo cars, which had an advantage of some 150 horsepower in the higher altitude thinner air. René Arnoux took pole position, with Nelson Piquet alongside in the new turbo Brabham BMW, with Villeneuve third and Patrese fourth, Prost and Peroni fifth and sixth. Then came the Williamses, with Rosberg out-qualifying Reutemann at the very first time of asking, then Watson and Alboreto making the Tyrrell look very good in tenth. Lauda had an excursion off the track which bent a suspension rod, and he could only manage 13th on the grid, just behind Salazar's ATS, which was looking very good and just ahead of an equally happy Derek Warwick, with a tweaked heart turbo engine giving him an extra £30 of boost. His unfortunate teammate Fabi never really got going, with a persistent technical glitch, meaning he couldn't even set a time and would have to wait for his Grand Prix debut. He was joined on the sidelines by both Arrows drivers and Riccardo Paletti in the Azella, with the other rookies Winkelhock in 20th and Bozell in 21st. 
The red lights turned green and Arnu and Prost both got fantastic starts, while PK, unused to doing standing starts with a turbo engine, let his revs drop too low and bogged down. His teammate Petrezzi had no such problem and went round him. As the field went into the first corner, Crowthorn, the Renaults already had a big lead, with Ferraris behind, then Rosberg, who got up ahead of Petrezzi. Meanwhile, the unfortunate Jarier had been nerfed into the catch fencing at Crowthorn, and his race was already over. After a couple of laps, the field was already starting to string out, with Arnoux, Prost, Villeneuve and Peroni drawing away from Rosberg, who had Petrezzi right on his gearbox, while PK down in 12th made his second big error of the day and locked up before going straight on at Crowthorn and into the catch fencing. Petrezzi finally managed to muscle past Rosberg, making it turbos in positions 1 through 5, but not for long, as on lap 7, a plume of white smoke announced a Ferrari engine failure and Gilles Villeneuve coasted to a halt. Before the race, some of the pundits had predicted that the turbos might be faster, but they might have trouble finishing the race, and it looked as though they might be right. Another driver having problems was Keki Rosberg, who'd had the knob on his gear lever come off in his hand and start rolling around in the footwell and occasionally getting under his pedals. The distraction enabled Reutemann to get past his upstart teammate, who now had John Watson on his tail to boot. By lap 8, the Renaults were already coming up to lap Chico Serra in the Fittipaldi, breezing past as if he was standing still, and soon disposing of Bozel and Daly too. While the TV cameras were, for some reason, watching Slim Borgard in the Tyrrell, Prost nipped by Arnu to take the lead on lap 15. Three laps later, another turbo car dropped out with Petrezzi suffering a loss of oil pressure in his BMW engine and touring into the pits, promoting Reutemann to fourth with Rosberg, Watson and Lauda chasing. Track temperatures were soaring and Pironi came in for new boots on lap 24 to lose lots of time with the sticking left rear wheel nut, so Reutemann was now third and waiting to capitalise on any problems the Renaults had. Not that they looked like they were in any danger at the moment, with Prost pulling out a big lead over Arnoux as the two Renaults simply left everyone else in the dust, a gap of over 40 seconds between Arnoux and third place Reutemann. Peroni was now back up to seventh and was already the last unlapped driver on the circuit. There was actually quite a battle developing over fourth place between Rosberg, Watson and Peroni, who'd now got past Lauda. On lap 41, Prost had his left rear tyre deflate as he was going round Barbecue Bend, and he began to nurse his car back around, the tyre finally disintegrating just as he turned into the pit lane. So Arnu now took the lead again, with Reutemann up to second, and then the Rosberg, Watson, Pironi, Lauda scrap, and a very impressive Alboreto now up to seventh. Prost had rejoined in eighth place, and set about making his way back up the field, disposing of Alboreto, and unlapping himself in forceful fashion from Arnu, who was increasingly unhappy with his own tyres. The Michelin engineers had looked at Prost's discarded tyres and figured our news would last the race, but the driver was picking up so much rubber off the track that he was having severe right vibrations and couldn't see his pit signals. Meanwhile, Peroni had got past Watson and Rosberg to go up to third, and was rapidly closing on second place Reutemann. Derek Warwick had a similar problem to Prost at the same place, but his tyre deflated a lot more rapidly and he was out. After the race, it was found that one of the bolts holding his suspension on had come loose and gouged a hole in the tyre. Arnu was definitely slowing now, while Peroni and Prost bore down on second place Reutemann. By lap 59, they were right up behind the Argentine, and the following lap they both went sweeping by, while the TV director was still busy watching Arnu. Arnu was still driving cautiously to preserve his tyres, while Prost had got past Peroni for second, again off camera, and was bearing down on his teammate with 13 laps to go, while Lauda and Watson were having a terrific scrap over sixth, eventually won by the Austrian, who then also disposed of Rosberg to go up to fifth. Once again missed by the cameras, Prost had caught and passed Arnu to retake the lead, while Peroni limped into the pits with a poorly engine. The Ferrari mechanics poked at it for a while, couldn't fix it, and sent him back out again to rejoin at the rear and tour around before coming back in. So in the closing stages, it was Prost, Arnu, Reutemann, Lauda and Rosberg, but Reutemann was closing in on Arnu and took him for second just a couple of laps before the end. Alain Prost took the chequered flag to take his fourth Grand Prix win, with Reutemann's second a fine reward for a strong race and vindication of Williams' decision to keep him on. Arnoux was a deeply unhappy third, with Lauda, Rosberg and Watson the other point scorers, and Alboreto just outside the points, with Winkelhock and Bozel both finishing their first Grand Prix. Although it had been an entertaining race, one thing was obvious – the Renaults were utterly dominant at Kyle Army, and while they wouldn't enjoy the benefits of high altitude everywhere, everybody else has a lot of work to do before the next race.